Well, I think what's interesting about this whole idea is you mentioned we're in a cold war with China. I think as time goes on, that's only going to become clearer even to the most resistant voices in Washington. Um, but what's interesting about this is it really gives an economic weapon against the Chinese Communist Party, one that's not mi a military confrontation. I agree with you. And, and, and I, don't, I find it curious why the current administration, you know, hasn't seized upon this. I think this was, um, but again, I, perhaps they're just coming late to the table. I think there's also some aspects here where, you know, you've seen, for example, when we had the AUKUS launch um, of the new submarine deal between Australia, the United Kingdom, uh, and the U.S., which was launched in San Diego, California. I mean, Antony Blinken didn't even show up for that launch. So I think it shows you to an extent. And then, of course, we saw the visit by uh, Secretary Yellen uh, from the Treasury to China and the way that they were feted. I, I find that that is perhaps a wrong approach. It's, it reeks a bit of, um, you know, Neville Chamberlain and peace in our time. Um, and I think we need to start taking this this, these issues a lot more seriously. And in my case, what I want to do is simply defend the integrity of the international finance system, uh, which they break all the rules of. And, and it's just not in this area. This is, you know, there's many areas where they do this. They've got great, you know, laws, uh, regulatory laws in the books, which they've cut and pasted from, say, the German uh, legal system, but they're simply not enforced. I mean, it's, it's really, they, 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 it's, it's not a, a, a country that's ruled by the rule of law and democratic institutions, but we allow them to operate our capital markets as if they do. I think what's crazy about this is if you look at Wall Street investors who they want to put money into China, let's say they don't care at all about, you know, the Chinese Communist Party, you know, killing people for organs or using rape as a form of torture or ethnic slave labor or whatever. They say that's not our problem, right? But nonetheless, what is their problem and what is in their interest is to make sure that the Chinese government adheres to at least certain norms of international uh, trade when it comes, or rules of international finance, right? Yeah. And so it should be in Wall Street's interest to say, yeah, actually we do need to enforce this bond issue uh, to set a precedent that you know our investments in China in other respects are also going to be honored. Isn't it kind of a weird disconnect that Wall Street on one hand is willing to uh, ignore the the bond issue, that is the, the debt that China owes American investors, including many of those institutions. Uh, and on the other hand, Wall Street is investing new money in Chinese bonds, for example, local government debt that they've recently bought over the last few years, uh, and many other types of investments in China. So yeah, isn't that a weird disconnect? If at first I they don't pay, try, try again. I think also it's a question. I used to work for a Democrat member of Congress, the late Congressman Tom Lantosh, and he said the veneer of civilization is paper thin. And I think that was a very profound statement. I think it speaks to the human dilemma. We are fallible people. And I know a lot of friends of mine from university and other aspects of my life who are doing lots of business in China. I have a friend of mine who I grew up with who's living there right now um, with his wife and children. And when I try to talk to him about these things, he just literally just... I, he blanks me and changes the subject matter or just simply will not engage, gives me a, you know, a blank stare. There are a lot of people that's just simply not convenient to think about the ugly truth of the things you mention. I mean, the fact that many people are wearing clothing made with Uyghur slave labor um, or you know, don't want to think about uh, the persecution of the Tibetans. I remember when I worked for uh, the late Congressman Lantos, he invited the Dalai Lama to the United States to the huge anxiety of the U.S. Uh, State Department, who put up a huge protest because they thought it upset relations with the PRC. So again, there's been, I think just, there have been different interests. A lot of people are more cynical, perhaps lack a moral framework or a moral compass, where they simply want to get rich and make a lot of money and have business as usual and overlook the horrors of these things and not think about them. And I think that speaks to, you know, the fact that there is just simply a lot of human failure involved. Also, with regard to the Senate and the House of Representatives, I've noticed just in my short time dealing on this recently, there's a lot of senators and congressmen who are willing to make lots of good messaging on this matter 
and a lot of others. When it comes to actually, you know, putting some teeth behind it, they 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 go they they're a bit shy. And I think that's because also Wall Street is lying in the coffers of a lot of these politicians in Washington. So I think we have to take that into consideration as well. I mean, in theory, with the specific bond issue, wouldn't it be that all it takes is for Biden, for example, to issue an order to Treasury Secretary Yellen to buy up these bonds and resolve the issue? Like Biden could just do that without an act of Congress. He could. He could absolutely require the Treasury Secretary to purchase these bonds. And as I said, affect your pennies and dollar. Not, I'm not saying buy over a trillion dollars, use over a trillion. And I don't think the bondholders are expecting that. Um, and then have them on the treasury books to either use them in negotiations or, as I said, simply pay off the U.S. $850 billion that we owe them in sovereign debt and still have monies left over. Do you think China would retaliate in a way? Is maybe their fear that, you know, China could do something to the U.S. economy if it decides to push the debt? Well, they could, but they didn't do that with Mrs. Thatcher. Mm. Um, so again, I think the other issue is that we're in a crisis of leadership. I, I, and I say this as someone who used to work for a Democrat member of Congress who was the um, chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. I don't actually think President Biden is always mentally present. I think we are in a crisis of leadership. I think we don't have a lot of people with the moral compass and the strong framework um, to actually take some of these hard decisions that need to be taken. As, as someone who's been working even most recently um, for the British government uh, as a civil servant, and having had an experience here in Washington as well to see Biden operate here in Washington or internationally up close, it's actually embarrassing. I mean, quite frankly, I think it's elder abuse. He's not doesn't appear to be mentally present or in, in control of all of his faculties all the time, which then leads the question, the government is governed by officials. Um, underneath him who are running things. And I think perhaps that needs to be, that needs more scrutiny. That's a whole other issue. We're just, the, the bottom line is we're in a crisis of leadership and we need, we need strong leadership on this. And I think we have it um, in the House and the Senate to a degree. I just think we're currently lacking that for the reasons I've indicated and others at the executive level. If only we could have President Margaret Thatcher. Well, I'm afraid she'd probably be rolling her grave right now if she saw the state of the UK, the UK Conservative Party, which, of course, has effectively become a woke, soft social democrat party, uh, which has become very weak on China and just about everything else. And I think that they're, although they got an 80 seat majority landslide victory uh, in the um, 2019 general election, I think it's safe to say they're going to be wiped out uh, if, it, if current polling uh, continues to, uh, to just about anyone because they've they're, they're a shadow of what Thatcher was in charge of. Well, I was going to ask, since you work for the UK government, you work for the US government, what is the similarities or differences on the other side of the pond? For starters, the woke um, ideology uh, has permeated the UK system to a degree. It came out of American academia, but it went to the United Kingdom and no country has embraced it at almost every level. To the, to, uh, further than any other country. So they're about five to 10 years ahead of the United States in the infiltration and total um, elite capture with that, um, uh, that, uh, that, that ideology. Um, we, we, we saw that recently with the canceling of the account of Nigel Farage and the resignation uh, this week of the chairman, uh, sorry, not the chairman, the uh, CEO of uh, the NatWest Bank. Um, over the cancellation of, um, of, of Nigel Farage's account only because they didn't like his political views, his beliefs on Brexit. Um, um, and then, of course, they leaked uh, and lied about his uh, personal financial uh, arrangements with the bank um, so that, to the BBC. I think we see a lot of elite capture in the UK, um, and as well in Canada with the Trudeau government uh, as well. And I don't think that um, we're as far gone in the States uh, as, as those two countries. But certainly from my experience, I mean, I spent so much time doing woke stuff and, and that took me away from doing what I was hired to do, which was trade promotion and trade policy. And that was the Department for International Trade. I actually asked our permanent secretary when I first joined, started working there in 2017 
And I said, what's the ultimate goal we have this year for the Department for International Trade? And she said, her name is Antonia Romeo. And she said, that's a very good question. She said, I want to make sure that this time next year, we get the highest ranking from Stonewall as the most inclusive employer for transgendered and non-binary people. Now, this is, this is the goal, her most important priority as the per, most senior civil servant working at the UK's Department for International Trade. I think when China sees that, they're laughing at us. I don't think we're being serious anymore. I mean, the day that the um, the Russians invaded Ukraine, both the Ministry of Defense uh, and the um, head of um, MI6 put out bizarre statements. The uh, Ministry of Defense put a statement saying we're going to continue with um, uh, Gay History Month at the the Ministry of Defense, which is the British version of the Pentagon. And MI6 uh, head said that... um, uh, President Putin's values don't represent ours, fine, but then went on to talk about, you know, gay stuff and, and, and LGBT stuff. And I just don't see, I think that, again, when Russia and China see us respond in that way, I think they're laughing at us. Um, and and uh, indeed, actually, I remember a senior British diplomat saying that this woke stuff, this was really a pillar uh, in promoting this as a pillar of Britain's foreign policy. Who decided that? And why has this happened under a so-called conservative government? Well, the response is it hasn't been very conservative. And I'm afraid that that ideology has embraced, has taken, it's, it's captured everything.